this, this long-term extension study is essentially um, a, uh, an open label study that uh, patients could elect to go into after they had completed any of the parent studies for PEG pseudocoquin. Uh, so there were, there were three of these, uh, two phase 1B studies, phase 2 and, and two phase 3 studies. Um, and uh, we presented uh, the, the first, essentially the first 48 weeks of uh, data. Uh, so uh, the vast majority of the patients who had participated in the clinical trials enrolled in, in the 307 study, which is the open label, uh, about 94% or 137 patients. Um, and uh, 107 of those have completed the 48 weeks of, of, uh, of exposure so far. Um, and what it shows really is consistency uh, in the hemoglobin. So a very important finding of the initial Pegasus study, as well as a more recent print study, was increased hemoglobin that we see um, uh, that uh, is we, something we don't always see for uh, terminal complement inhibitors. Um, but uh, with the Pegasus study, as well as PRINCE, there was a, a higher hemoglobin that uh, patients were able to achieve. Uh, and what our 48-week data now show is that that's a persistent finding. So patients had uh, essentially established uh, hemoglobins around 12 grams per deciliter. Um, it uh, showed quite good control of their hemolysis with uh, LDH around the upper limit of normal. Um, in addition to that, we looked at facet fatigue. Uh, so that's a score looking at quality of life that's typically used in, in these studies. Uh, and uh, patients who had started uh, typically well below the, the general population mean score uh, were able to achieve that or even surpass it in some situations. Uh, and in, importantly, also uh, many patients were able to be uh, transfusion independent. Uh, so very important clinical outcomes there as well. Um, and uh, in addition to that, the, the safety um, was uh, quite well uh, tolerated, a, a safety profile similar to what we've seen uh, in, the, in the parent studies. Um, no, uh, no thrombotic events, so that's very important to see. No meningococcal infections, which is a, a type of infection we're particularly concerned when we're blocking complement for these patients. Um, the uh, main side effect that, or treatment emergent adverse event, I should say, um, was uh, uh, reported hemolysis. So this is a physician reported hemolysis or, or acute blood cell breakdown during the trial. And that happened in about 17% of patients. Um, and that's something that uh, we just need to continue to monitor. Uh, it's um, a, as the data mature, something that we'll have to explore and look at the potential triggers for this uh, and how best uh, to, to manage that yeah, because we are quite new into the proximal inhibitors uh, in the management of the PNH, where we have almost a two decades now of experience with uh, terminal blockade. I think what it really shows is that there is a, another option, particularly for patients, I, I think, who have persistent anemia, despite uh, being uh, uh, controlled with, with C5 inhibition. That's still the most important thing to do uh, in PNH is make sure that you're controlling that intravascular hemolysis. But if we're also able to, on top of that, add an incremental uh, hemoglobin improvement for these patients, that can certainly translate into a much improved quality of life. And in addition to that, there is some freedom of, of, uh, of administration. This is a subcutaneous, uh, typically twice weekly or every three day um, uh, administration that patients or, or caregivers can learn to give them themselves as opposed to having a nurse come in to give an IV infusion every two or every eight weeks. So there's some freedom there, but there's also uh, improved outcomes. Um, but beyond that, it's uh, again, it's a, a newer uh, approach to treatment, to treating PNH and um, it's the, it's uh, certainly promising and we just need to follow these patients along and make sure that there aren't any other new safety signals that we need to see over the, over the next coming years. Mm -hmm.